The collapse of the Roman Republic was a direct result of its inability to adapt the outmoded constitutional forms of a small Latin city-state to the political necessities presented by its growing power as the hegemon of the Mediterranean. Perhaps none of these old systems exemplifies the conservative desire to cling to an outmoded status quo more than the continued maintenance of the Pomerium, a sacred boundary dating back to the mythical founding of the city by Romulus on April 21st, 753 BC. Romans believed that it was created as part of a religious ritual during which the founder himself yoked a bull and a cow to a bronze plow to enact a sacred border which would dedicate the demarcated city to the gods and define his city as distinct from the rest of the world. Even though the actual city quickly grew beyond this initial boundary, the Roman constitutional system defined the legal city only as the area enclosed by the Pomerium, with everything outside of it being viewed as territory that belonged to the people and senate of Rome. Though hard facts surrounding the founding of the city remain murky, we know that the concept of a sacred boundary that dedicated select territory to the devotion and protection of certain gods can be traced to the Etruscan civilization that dominated northern Italy during the age of Romulus. This is borne out by archaeology, and even freely admitted by Livy, despite his patriotic sentiments and willingness to diminish Etruscan influence over other aspects of early Roman culture. There remains some uncertainty about the origins of the term Pomerium, but Plutarch gives its origins as deriving from the Latin words postmurum, which translates to after or beside the wall. We do, however, know that the Latin term for city, herbs, comes from urvus, the Latin word for plow, much like the one that Romulus used to demarcate the Pomerium. This astounding bit of etymology shows that the sacred boundaries are inextricably tied to the emergence of distinct cities in the Latin context and provides insight into how Romulus could be viewed as the founder of Rome when people had already inhabited the site for generations. He was the first to draw the consecrated border, which made him the founder of an entirely new community and space in the Roman reckoning. Frustratingly to scholars today, the boundary lines of the Pomerium are still unknown. We have a general idea, but it's impossible to say where the border ended and began. We know the boundary established by Rome's original stone walls, which were erected by the king Servius Tullius, but these walls differ from the Pomerium because, since the Pomerium was a simple furrow, it did not take landscape and topography into account in the ways that walls did. However, it is likely that these walls fully enclosed the sacred space established by Romulus's original Pomerium. Whether Romulus was a historical person or not, it is clear that the Romans under the monarchy already had a profound reverence for the Pomerium, as the expansion of defenses under Servius Tullius was accompanied by buried human sacrifices, which archaeologists believe was done to symbolically mirror the death of Remus, and as an offering to placate Romulus's command that whoever altered the boundary stones be put to death. To understand the importance of the Pomerium in the Roman mind, we must remember the primacy of precedence and taboo in shaping social interactions. There was likely a wide range of theological views which the early Romans adhered to, but each adhered to the same religious framework, meaning they were certain that the gods existed in some form, and that disregarding the expressed edicts established by tradition would bring sanction of some sort. But if fear of the gods was not enough, then the social stigma that would result from violating core religious regulations in a society with universal reverence for the divine was enough to warrant caution and ensure that the pomerium was respected. As the sacred ground that constituted the city itself, there were a number of regulations which created a meaningful distinction with the wider world. Even gods were subject to the pomerium, as temples associated with foreign cults had to be constructed outside the traditional boundary. The one Roman deity worshipped outside the Pomerium was the ancient war goddess Bellona, as it was viewed as prudent for her to remain at the beck and call of soldiers at all times. The most well-known taboo was the restriction on carrying arms within the Pomerium, but there were also prohibitions on the burial of the dead within the border and limitations on the power of magistrates and pro-magistrates. This same restriction was also applied to foreign potentates, and is the reason that Cleopatra was forced to stay outside the city in Caesar's villa when she visited to press the claims of their son Caesarion. To demonstrate the reduction in their magisterial powers, 
The lictors which accompanied a magistrate had to remove the axe from their fasces. This meant that even a consul was subjected to the prohibition on weapons within the pomerium. This vital regulation was only disregarded for dictators, whose lictors were permitted to keep the axes in their fasces within the pomerium. Rome's republican constitution was primarily based on precedent and relied on social sanction and political pressure to enforce the law. As the rewards associated with political power over the entire Mediterranean grew steadily, more and more Romans became willing to disregard the most maiorum and gradually chip away at republican institutions. The declining sanctity of laws associated with the pomerium mirrors the decline in republican civic virtue. The most egregious blow against the pomerium occurred when the reactionary warlord Sulla led his army against the city in 88 BC to overthrow the populares in order to win legal backing for his command in a war against Mithridates. He marched his legions into the city under arms to seek out his political opponents, using Roman soldiers to murder his rivals and their backers in a wave of unprecedented violence within the city itself that would forever transform every aspect of life in the Republic. Sulla's wanton disregard for the pomerium would be compounded by his decision as dictator to expand the boundary of the new pomerium, a propaganda move that was intended to place him on par with Romulus as a new founder of Rome. Though Sulla certainly had no qualms about spilling blood, it is a reflection of the evolution of Roman religion that this expansion does not appear to be accompanied by the burial of sacrificial victims. Subsequent expansions under Augustus and Claudius would be accomplished through the burial of statues meant to symbolically stand in for real victims. Though rioting and small-scale armed conflict had existed within the Pomerium prior to Sulla, most notably in the assassination of the Gracchi brothers and their supporters, it was Sulla's dictatorship which provided the blueprint for struggles that would define the death of the Republic. Not surprisingly, other prohibitions were disregarded, and the subsequent dictator, Julius Caesar, was given the right to be buried within the Pomerium prior to his assassination. The birth of the empire solidified the power of absolute monarchs over the old Republican norms, and Trajan's ashes were interned at the base of his column, which was located within the Pomerium. The most politically salient aspect of the Pomerium in the late Republic was the stipulation that provincial pro-magistrates and generals were unable to enter the Pomerian without resigning their commands. The goal of this was to prevent those with Imperium from exercising power within the city, as candidates needed to enter the Pomerian to officially register, meaning that it was theoretically impossible to run for office while commanding an army. So strong was the aversion to armed forces within the city that the Comitia Centuriata met outside the Pomerium when voting, because this had originally been a military formation. The inability of commanders to enter the Pomerium is one of the reasons why the meeting house which Pompey built to accompany his theater was constructed outside the Pomerium, as Roman generals needed to conduct meetings with the Senate, but were becoming increasingly loath to lay down their power. This culminated in 71 BC, when Pompey and Crassus would use the presence of their armies outside the city to press for exemption from this rule, and both were elected consul for the following year while in command of legions. Later, in the run-up to his civil war with Caesar, Pompey governed Spain in absentia, residing just outside the Pomerium, but regularly meeting with officials in a magisterial capacity despite holding Imperium. This farcical arrangement and his status as sole consul signified the death of the Republic and should be cause for reflection for anyone claiming that Pompey's aristocratic-backed army intended to restore liberty if it had defeated Caesar. Prior to the breakdown of the late Republic, the one exception to the prohibition on generals entering the Pomerium was to celebrate a triumph. The triumphator was allowed within the city on this special day and it was his soldiers, and not their commander, which lost their status. So while the general wore full military regalia, and was made to emulate the presence of Jupiter himself, soldiers marched in civilian dress, though a savvy general would have given them nice clothing to wear for the occasion. Ironically, it was Caesar, who is often regarded as the supreme enemy of republican virtue, who laid down his command and disbanded his legions to enter the city as a candidate, 
foregoing his right to triumph as a result. We may never know the exact dimensions of the sacred primarium, the line separating the city from the world it sought to rule, but the fact that the boundary stones have been found for the new borders of the pomerium enacted by the Emperor Claudius should fill us with hope that we may yet find remains indicating the border that accompanied Romulus's original founding. But even if we learn its location in time and space, the challenge of the pomerium for modern minds will always be in understanding how the mysticism inherent in this boundary demonstrates a clear distinction between how we analyze our surroundings and how the ancients interpreted the world around them through the constant flurry of activity by gods, fates, and forces that human minds were powerless to comprehend. As such, the Pomerium will forever separate us from the ancient Romans, no matter how much we learn about it.